Test, test. Um, good afternoon, Salam Sejahtera, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, very happy to be here today and to show how much we have dovetailing our presentations. You've seen a very strongly visual presentation previously. I will focus on literally the audio, uh, but showing you how it mixes with the kind of um, analog archives, if you will, that, that we do have and the stories that they tell. Right, so archives come in many formats and certainly, as many speakers have pointed out, we have to di digitize them. Um, why? One is because you just need to create that surrogate, that extra copy, in case the worst happens to the original. Um, but there are some cases where you cannot keep every last original either. Um, in Singapore, we're very challenged for space. Um, it's not like in the US where you can, they dump all the paper they have in some salt mine, or in Australia, I, I've spoken to archivists there where they have lots of uh, storage in desert areas, and they sometimes can shut down air conditioning uh, for half the year because conditions are suitable. But in Southeast Asia, you know, you are running air conditioning 24 by 7. Uh, it's impossible to do so. Therefore, in Singapore, um, often our surrogate for a paper document is the microfilm, right? So that microfilm that can still last, if properly created, 500 years in theory, right? So you have the microfilm, you have the digital, and for the most important documents, we also keep the paper still, right? But we are digitizing also to give access, right? To give that 24 by 7 access to everyone, not just in Singapore, but across the world. Right, so that's what Archives Online looks like. Um, we moved from about 10,000 page views a month back in 2012. We are at about 500,000 to 600,000 page views a month now. Partly because we have digitized aggressively and put a lot of content up. So, let's start. All right, so we've got, in terms of the printed word, um, our documents go back to the 1800s, all right? So we share a long history with Malaysia. Uh, you've heard someone speak about Penang and Malacca earlier. So Singapore is last of that threesome of that straight settlements. And we have rec our oldest record is actually the Penang Gazettes, going back to 1800, all right? So here you see a, um, one of Raffles' regulations, right? Where he tried to outlaw the, the slave trade. Um, and if you read the text, which has been transcribed, uh, it's interesting because Raffles was aware that when, when the letter, the cover letter, when he sent these regulations out, actually said that um, you have to publish this. So he was talking to uh, the British resident then, William Falker. You have to publish this in the native languages, meaning Malay and, and some form of Chinese. And because this was such an important regulation to rule out slavery, slave trade, he said you would go around announcing it by the beat of the gong as well, right? So there were no newspapers as such. Uh, I suppose in England, they may have a town crier ringing a bell, but Raffles was aware to use local instruments and you go around beating the gong, telling people that there are such new regulations and the slave trade is at an end. Wonderful, we have wonderful stories in these records about how society used to be back in the 1800s, but they are so challenging to get into, right? Um, for myself, I typically take about 45 minutes to acclimatize before I can read it at a fair, decent speed. Um, so we, we went to speak to people at Google, we went to speak at people on Amazon. This was about two, three years back. I'm sure technology has moved on, but they said, look, we can deal with the odd word here and there, you know, in banking document signatures that they can recognize people's signatures and all that. But when you have thousands of volumes of documents like this, you have millions of pages of script like this written slightly differently, they say we don't have a machine that can successfully transcribe yet. Right? So what do you do in the meantime? We have thrown it all um, to the citizens of the world, not just Singapore as such. We have a citizen archivist website we put up all these manuscripts and every night about 50 pages get done. All right? Every night 50 pages get done. Roughly about 25 people, I think about 15 are very dedicated, another 10 come and go. 
uh, but 50 pages get done every night such that you can see there, this is the entire Raffles volume. Uh, we have that marker. Green means it's all done. It's all transcribed. Yeah. So you see a transcription here. So it's now totally searchable. Right? So we are going through the records and uh, we are very confident <laughs> that in the coming years we will finish the entire set. Um, ah, I have an audio there. Um, I wanted to share as well that uh, we have a very strong practice of oral history and we even have an oral history which tells a story about all the way back to the time of Raffles. Uh, you will hear the voice of our recently, um, well, recent uh, Haji Ofman Wok, one of our pioneer ministers who was very proud of his, of his roots going back to the islands of Riau and, and the, the Orang Lawut days of, of Singapore. If you hear his voice now. Um, incidentally, uh, were your parents from Malaya or Indonesia? No, my, my ancestors came from the Rio Archipelago, I believed. Uh, I'm the seventh generation of this old uh, ancestry from the Rio Archipelago. Uh, I could remember my grandfather on the maternal side, <clears throat> but according to him, he was still alive when I was what, about 16 or 17 years old, used to tell us that his grandfather came down to Singapore and opened up a piece of land somewhere in Thompson Road. So his grandfather was killed by a tiger while, while, while doing work on the land. His father then uh, found, uh, found, found, found a job with the Temenggong was a sultan then here and uh, he became a sort of harbour master then uh, controlling the movement of uh, crafts in the Singapore harbour then he was there until uh, Raffles came in and uh, then after the retirement of the Temenggong he did business on behalf of the, of the Temenggong with the Indonesians and my grandfather was then what, about 17 or 16 years old and followed him around. And they did business for what, 13 to 15 years before my grandfather really settled down in Singapore. And then, uh, after that then, uh, my, my, my great-grandfather passed away. And uh, my grandfather then uh, stopped doing business then uh, he joined the Johor military forces. They were the personal bodyguard of the Sultan then, Sultan of Johor. Oral history takes some time to listen through, but just in that little clip, about three minutes or so long, you hear links with his family, with Sultan of Johor. You hear links with the Temenggong. You hear stories about being eaten by tigers, and, and there are many stories about being eaten, people being attacked by tigers in, in the Raffles records. Uh, you see business cases, the, the commissioner as such of police writing a business case saying, I need to buy goats. I need 50 straight dollars to buy goats. Or, or uh, that, that, sorry, the, it's the Indian currency back then. To, to buy goats, I need to buy poison. I need to tie them up somewhere because too many people are being killed by tigers. Um, you hear a story about his great, great Nenek Moyang, you know, his descendants becoming, uh, forefathers were, was, one of them was the Shah Banda, all right? So the harbour master is the Shah Banda, all right? If you know John Mixick, who's the famous Singapore archaeologist, he has a nicer name for it. I think harbour master sounds very modern. Um, John Mixick says it is Lord of the Harbour. But let me share something. We don't just stare at the archives that we have, and, and that's something that I would urge everybody to not do. All right? So um, many countries, of course, in Southeast Asia were colonized, so a lot of our modernish records um, from 1900s onwards may be with other archives in other countries. Um, but there are also ancient records. So there's been lots of debate about whether, you know, how many people were there in Singapore, was there any trade going on before Raffles and so on and so forth? And here we have a document, a map from 1604 from the Portuguese archives. Uh, it's also printed in quite a famous book by this chap called D. Aridia. Look at 
there's Singapura there. The, it is drawn slightly in the reverse. Joho is at the bottom. Sumatra is at the side. Singapura spelled slightly different. But look at the words. There is a, spelled differently, but a Shah Bandaria back in 1604. There was enough going on. I'm not sure how much there was, but enough going on for there to be a Shah Banda, a lot of the harbour. For those who know Singapore, there is Tanyon Ru, which is Tanjong Ru. There is Sungai Bedok, which is Sune Bode, as they pronounce here. And Tanah Merah. Tanah Merah spelled differently. But what it also tells us, and that's something we will share with Malaysia, and maybe, well, the, the larger Malayan archipelago as well, that the formation of the language was even so back then. The spelling is different, but the sounds are there. Yep, so there are lots of exciting things to find um, in the records of ancient records of other countries as well that we are actively digitizing um, in order to know our longer history. Slightly more modern, here we have Tanah Merah again, but now you have an aerial photograph taken by the uh, Royal Air Force, the British, when they were in Singapore. Uh, but they took these photo maps uh, largely because of the communist insurgency during the Malayan emergency. They were flying low to find campsites. Of course, they were also making better maps for, for Malaysia. But I just found out, in fact, just yesterday that they flew all the way to Thailand and they were making maps of the entire region, even in Hong Kong. Right? So there's a bit of that shared history as well in terms of the RAF and the work they did um, during both the emergency and the confrontasi period. But here, something I want to share. The, these aerial photographs that were once taken to search out communists um, are now being used by um, modern-day uh, citizen archivists um, in order to search out old Singapore. Right? So they are, they are peering at this every day. So part of that 500,000 page views a week, uh, a month I get is uh, people just looking through these um, photographs and we have put up as high a resolution as we can and they are just dipping down, looking, matching them together in order to recreate and see the stories of Singapore of old, to, to market to stories their grandparents told them about, to, to link up sites to stories that they have heard uh, in books. And the latest um, that I'd like to share, and I'm going to try to play this through as much as possible. Um, we were fortunate enough to come by a collector recently, and we are slowly digitizing this. Um, takes a lot of work. Um, the shellac, the old vinyls are in a, quite a poor state. Takes a lot of cleaning, takes machinery, sometimes second by second digitization. But many do not know that the commercial music recording began in 1903. Um, it was first done in Singapore. Um, advertisements will go out all the way to Thailand, to Indonesia, Malaysia to say, come to a certain hotel on a certain day and gramophone will be there to record you. And so I played for you one of the, well, 1903, so this would be the first set of recordings. Have a listen. <laughs> Right, just a taster. Uh, there are, there's two minutes more of that. Um, but these were sounds from Southeast Asia, people coming to Singapore to sing into this big recording uh, device. Um, the gramophone took it back to Europe. Sometimes they got it pressed in India. And they sold very well uh, in Singapore and in Southeast Asia. The next one is interesting. It is um, showing how World War II came to our shores as well. Uh, this is Hitler's cruelty, all right? Kabwasan. Thank you. 
Okay. Uh, what was interesting is that about um, a week ago, I got I was contacted by someone who said that uh, I'm the son of Miss Fadilla. Um, and there's a you know a Southeast Asian connection. Uh, he says that uh, I need to meet and verify everything. But he says that look, uh, his, his his the parents of his mother, um, his father, the father was from the Philippines. The mother was local, but of Portuguese extraction. Um, they sort of lived in Malaysia, recorded in Singapore. Um, Colombia went all the way to get her voice. And the most interesting of all, uh, to be checked, is that I was told that the lyricist could have been Tunku Abdul Rahman himself. Right? So, akan uh, datang, we will find out, verify, get information. But this is a very rich collection that records not just, um, well, the, the music industry was based in Singapore as such, but it really recorded the voices from all over Southeast Asia. Um, what's in an image? I, I put this up. Um, okay, resolution, they're not so good, but it's just the contrast. Documents tell a story as well. You have the proclamation of Malaysia um, to your left and the proclamation of Singapore to your right. One is beautiful paper, um, lovely manuscript, like a marriage uh, coming together, and then there's the separation, of course. Okay. So the the... Images tell a story as well. And I want to show another shared history as such. All right? So, Malaysians here, you know a lot. All right? the, his experience as a child, post-World War II in the 40s and 50s, getting the supplement of milk. This is a picture from Singapore. Children getting their supplement of milk. Yeah? Um, and... In, in the National Archives of Singapore, we keep the broadcast archives as well. Sometimes people say, ah, you keep, why you keep all the radio recordings? You know, do they teach us anything? Do they tell us anything? So we shall listen to Lat as he was when he was age 28 uh, in an interview in Singapore. Penukis kartun Encik Muhammad Nur Khalid yang lebih terkenal dengan nama Lat dari Malaysia telah berada di Singapura baru-baru ini bersempena dengan pelancaran bukunya yang ketiga Lat the Kampung Boy yang mengesahkan riwayat hidupnya dari mula lahir di Perak hinggalah berusia 10 tahun. Kini berusia 28 tahun, pernah mengikuti kursus di England dalam tahun 1975. Ikutilah perbualannya dengan Azmi Mahmud. Buku ini uh, adalah buku yang, yang dah uh, begitu lama saya simpan dalam uh, dalam kepala, dalam dada. Dan akhirnya selepas bertahun-tahun uh, baru dapat saya dari saya keluarkan dan saya, saya suka rasa lapang uh, sekarang sebab uh, ianya ialah buku yang paling paling mustahak uh, pada anggapan saya uh, kalau dibandingkan dengan kerja-kerja saya yang sudah-sudah kerana tema uh, apa ni pekerjaan saya selama ini ialah uh, kebudayaan dan uh, apa saja yang saya buat untuk uh, akhbar ataupun untuk uh, majalah sebagainya semuanya bertemakan kebudayaan dan buku ini adalah untuk merakam ciri-ciri uh, kebudayaan uh, yang saya tahu iaitu kebudayaan di kampung dan kebudayaan uh, Melayu Okay, um, I, I wanted to play that just to illustrate that history our knowledge, information comes from many sources. It's a question of bringing it all together, um, seeing how it all links up. And here we have um, a radio interview, but it tells you the background to this book. It's in Malay, right? So for those who, who don't understand the language as such, the, he's talking about how this is, book has always been in his heart and it's something he always wanted to do. Um, but, you know, he was, he was earning a living, so he had to draw caricatures of politicians for a long time for newspapers. But finally, he got down to doing this, and this was something that was most important to him because it, it reflected his, his culture and, and, and the life in the kampung back then. Right? The, the National Archives of Singapore is part of the National Library Board in Singapore, and so there's this rich collection of stories from Asia. Um, over 24,000 books that have been collected dating back to 1850 um, where you have here, of course, the famous story from Malaysia, fairy tale, a fairy tale from Philippines, a folk tale from Thailand, 
Another folktale here of Judge Rabbit, I understand, um, who is quite famous in, in Khmer folktale, Cambodia. And a Malayan there, uh, part of a Singapore folktale. Um, these stories tell something about the values, the beliefs, the culture of our peoples. But as um, Sarah and other speakers have shared earlier, of course, copyright does prevent us from making all this available online. But I always believe that the archives will outlive any copyright. So in due course of time, we will be able to put these stories up for everyone to see. Yeah, but in the meantime, the job of the archives is to make sure we collect them in good time so that these are not lost. Um, share a little bit about the ASEAN Digital Library, which the National Library Board is, is helping to push forward. This is something that they are doing with the other nine national libraries in ASEAN, where they are going to link up all their rare materials and put them, make them accessible, searchable from one website. So here you see the different types of materials that we put up. 77,000 items are, are raided, being raided at this time, and 30,000 more are being pledged. So you have drawings from Indonesia, Malaysia, and so on and so forth from all the ASEAN countries made searchable in one place. Um, they will point back to your own website so that people will come to know your websites in each country and the rich resources that, that sit there uh, sometimes unknown to people. So this is a rough look of what it look like uh, due to be launched sometime in July or August this year. Right? This is one example where we can get together and put information together. Um, so that we can leverage on, on platforms that some may have and then make sure that the word goes out to across all of Southeast Asia. Um, the, there was some mention earlier of the Asian Film Archives. We are happy that they are the first in Singapore um, to be able to get their uh, collection inscribed, the categories collection. But they, they do restore other movies as well. Here's Moon Over Malaya, a 1950s show. If you know your Singapore, this Esplanade area now has the durian and lots of tall buildings in the background there. The, where the um, city hall used to sit, you have buildings at the background and a shot taken two years ago. So in movies, you'll be able to see sights and sounds of how things used to be. And of course, Singapore, Malaysia, we share that rich heritage as well. Um, we have Mat Bon in the collection. Dang Anum, this one we are restoring right now. All right? So this one has been compared to Kurosawa. And those of you who know your movies, this is like Kurosawa, I'm telling you that. So wait out for it. Um, and there's also, of course, Nodin Ahmad here, who to me is always the pendeka, the real pendeka. Right? Better even than P. Ramli. Um, but let me play something that we have also in our archives. You know Momo Latif? Who knows Momo Latif? All right. So, Tudong Periyok used to be my favorite song. All right. But when we got that collection of music, um, I heard this one that we have just digitized as well. And now I'm troubled. I'm not sure which one is better. All right. and, but we also have an oral history in the National Archives collection. And it's online. It's totally online. Um, just going back to 2012, you would have to come to the archives physically and listen to tape, cassette tapes. Right? But in the last three years, we have put everything that's open access online. So there are over 3,000, about 4,000, well, 3,800 interviews that are now just streaming live online. And if you go there, you'll find out why she's called Momo. All right? So go to archives online, go and find out. All I will tell you is yes, it has to do with a Russian circus owner. All right? Now leave it at that. Um, I'd like to play you Roda Dunia, which is something we have digitized and we hope to put online very soon. <laughs>
kamu sebagai orang yang berharta Jangan sekali membanggakan harta dan bendanya Thank you. Go online. Thank you very much, Eric. As somebody who loves uh, music. For